Changing a core part of the game is a big decision to make, but we think that this new design direction will greatly improve the game. So in this video, I'm going to explain how things used to work, what were the issues with that older design, why this new system will fix those issues, and how this new system is going to work. Hey, I interrupt this video to say that we've just released our Steam page. Go check it out and wishlist it if you want, because, you know, I want the clicks. I want, give, Steam needs the clicks, I need the clicks. You must feed the clicks to us. Feed us the clicks, we need the clicks. Click on it, click on it. Is this working or not? <laughs> anyway, back to the actual video now. The core part of the game that we're looking to change is how we manage power between the different systems inside our ship. This is a big change to make, as system power management is a core part of gameplay. While we're changing how we're managing that power though, we're not changing that we're managing the power. We want to stay true to the core of the game, and that means management and hectic gameplay. We will evaluate whether this new system is better or worse for the game based upon how it contributes towards this core gameplay direction. Before, how you would manage power between systems would be by taking this cute little adorable alien called Ziggy. You would take him and then you would chuck him into this microwave. Now, this isn't actually a microwave, but we do understand that it does look a bit like one. So you chuck him into this microwave looking box and then you kill him, draining the immense amount of energy from inside him and using it to power up your ship. This Ziggy will power up that system. So if you chuck it into life support, you will power up your life support. And if you chuck it into navigation, well, you're gonna power up your navigation. This design did work pretty well, but it did lead to some issues. One of the biggest issues was the size of the boxes that you needed to put the Ziggies into. They needed to be this big so that you could fit your hand in to chuck in or pull out a Ziggy. This takes up a lot of space in our ship. This then limits our options in how we can design our systems. Like what if we wanted a system to take two Ziggies? or if we wanted a special insta use Ziggy for a special boost. Now there are a few different options for removing or shrinking these boxes, but we ended up going in a slightly different direction. Instead of having lots of boxes all around the ship, we instead have one big box. And then if we put a Ziggy into that bigger box, we can instead power up a battery this battery can then be taken and plugged in to any particular system that needs power. So does this battery solution solve the design issues we wanted to solve? We wanted less space in the ship taken up by our power management system, and that's certainly true. This is a lot bigger than this. We also want a fluid power management system, and this new battery system really allows for that. Having two battery slots for one system allows for hot swapping power, quickly switching batteries while keeping the light metaphorically and also literally on. You could also choose to insert two batteries at the same time to keep the system running longer without intervention. Adding or removing power using a battery is also super quick and fluid thanks to a satisfying interaction that we've created. Talking about interaction, you know what that means? I need to explain how we made it. Weirdly, I seem to always do that on my channel. Maybe because you spend a lot of time on interactions and this channel is about what you do and why. Yeah, yeah, um, that does make sense. That does, he does make a point, he does make a point. There are two main interactions that the battery needs. One is plugging the battery into a system and the other is plugging it into the battery charger. These interactions have some similarities. They have three main stages, a magnet stage, a push-in stage, and finally a locking stage. If you've watched my previous videos, you're probably aware at this point that to implement this, I'll be using a force, physics constraint, and some logic. This is a common formula that I use for lots of my interactions, and I explain it in a previous video. 
So firstly, the magnet stage. This stage activates whenever the bottom of the battery gets near an attachment point. This sucks the bottom of the battery towards the point at which it is going to be inserted into. This is done through a force continuously pulling the base of the battery to the base of the insertion point. This magnet effect serves a couple of purposes. Firstly, it shows the player, hey, there's something to do here with the battery. Secondly, it allows us to smoothly move into the second stage of the interaction, allowing for controller and player error. The second stage is a pushing stage. This is where once the battery is put into the right place, it can then slot in to the slot. This then locks all movement and rotation apart from in and out of the slot. You can now push the battery until it locks in for the final and simplest stage. It's locked in and you can't move it. Ah, uh, wait a sec, we actually do want to be able to move it because we need to be able to pull it out now that we've pushed it in. We have a button on the top of the battery that will pop out once it is locked in. Clicking this button will then pop out the battery and now we can just reverse through the three stages. So then we go to the pushing stage, but during the pushing stage, you can also pull it out. We then go to the magnet stage, and again, we can pull it out further, and the entire interaction is complete. This is quite a complicated interaction, and so there were quite a few issues when creating this. The first two issues were related to an oversight when I was programming it, assuming that there would be one battery and one battery slot. When there were two batteries and one battery slot, things would go wrong. Also, if there were two battery slots and one battery, things would also go wrong. Let's fix these bugs. Fixing bugs isn't always the most fun, but we might as well get it done now. I mean, we can't just ship a game with everything being broken in it. These issues were quite trivial to fix though. A more difficult issue was this weird glitching that could occur when holding the battery in particular places. This was due to the way we were trying to work out which state should the battery be in. This is actually quite a difficult problem to solve. What state does the player expect us to be in? A large part of this interaction and well, all VR interactions is trying to determine player intent with limited information and then responding to that player intent with satisfying virtual interactions. Let's examine this by looking at a particular interaction with the battery. Let's say the player is pulling the battery hard to the side and you're in the pushing stage. If they're pulling it hard to the side, they might be trying to pull it out but during the pushing stage, you can't pull the battery out to the side. What if you're at the top of the pushing stage? Maybe you should be able to pull it out because that's probably what the player is expecting. But what point does it make sense to be pulled out to the side? Here makes sense, but here probably makes not so much sense. What should happen at the boundary between being able to yank it out to the side and not being able to yank it out to the side? What happens if they're trying to push it in at the same time as yanking out to the side? Pulling to the side would imply that they want to pull it out, but the pushing in implies they want to push it in. How should you respond to an action like that? This is where you get into the real nitty gritty details of implementing VR interactions. The player at any point has the ability to choose to do anything with their hands. These movements can be completely impossible within the virtual world, but they're not actually bound by that of virtual world. They can move their hand forwards in the real world, while in the virtual world there's a wall there. Trying to respond to the impossible physical movements with satisfying virtual interactions is difficult, but none of game dev is easy. I didn't choose this route because it was going to be a nice cushy ride, because it really isn't going to be. I choose this route because it is difficult, because it excites me, it's my reason to get up in the morning 
and I wouldn't have it any other way. Thanks for watching. If you want to check out my Twitch, I stream more of my game dev every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. If you want to click the buttons that YouTube legally requires me to tell you about, they are down there. You could press them, I might appreciate it. There's also Discord if you want to stay more up to date with what me and the team is working on with this game. Thanks again for watching and I'll see you next time.